Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin ve salatu ve selamu ala rasulina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmaîn. In the name of Allah, all merciful, all compassionate. All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almighty and peace and blessings be upon the prophet Muhammed and all the prophets before him peace and blessings be upon them. I would like to greet all of you with the peace, mercy, and love of Allah Almighty. I humbly ask for Allah Almighty to protect us from all kinds of calamities, illnesses, diseases, visible and invisible dangers and evils. Help and protect all the health professionals, caregivers, care workers. Grant cure and remedy to all the patients who have been afflicted with this harmful coronavirus disease and all other illnesses. Help us to take lessons from the miserable conditions we are currently in. Fill our hearts with love and your presence, O oh Allah. Forgive us for our mistakes and errors and sins. Help me to articulate my words in a more intelligible and beautiful manner so that all my listening friends currently can follow me with ease and understand me better. O oh Allah, increase our knowledge and wisdom and accept our prayers and supplications. Amen. Respected friends, this evening's lecture will focus on the preservation of health through physical and spiritual immunity. As a continuation of the lecture that we have given last week, entitled From Self-Isolation to Self-Realization. There was a follow-up question concerning my lecture from, again, our friend, Mr. Jerry Kuhi, and which I would like to quote to you. And he says, many Christians believe the coronavirus is a punishment. So we are victims. The Quran says it is a test, a really hard one. And we need to use our spirituality and faith to struggle and conquer it. Then we are rewarded. Okay. And question ends. Question and the quotation ends. So, this was the question by our friend Kupi. Yes, indeed. Mr. Kupi has well understood our presentation. I need to re-emphasize that according to the teachings of the Quran and the prophetic sunnah, this current outbreak, as for all other similar diseases and hardships, is indeed a trial, an attribulation, a probation, or we call bala by Allah Almighty, that human beings are subjected to go through in the mortal life of this temporal world in preparation for the immortal life of the eternal world. As a matter of fact, this question posed by our friend gives us the opportunity to determine from the viewpoint of Islamic spirituality the appropriate position of a believer towards such predicaments or hardships, challenges, including this current outbreak. In keeping with the explicit teachings of the religion of Islam, meaning the Quran and the prophetic sunnah, authentic prophetic sunnah, we can safely state that at any rate, we have no right to cast blame on anybody or on any nation or any country for the current coronavirus outbreak unless it has been established and proven to be so by clear-cut facts and evidences. Nor do we have the right to attribute to Allah Almighty by speculating that as if he were punishing all humanity with this severe affliction because of their disobedience to him or because of their transgression against him. In making such a hypothetical and blunt statement, we are probably inadvertently, unknowingly, though most 
most of the time with good intention and bona fide reasons, putting ourselves in the wrong place, meaning in the position of God and deciding on his behalf, forgetting that we are human, whereas he is divine. Human cannot take the role of the divine, nor can he hold God responsible for the wrongdoing and corruption committed by the human being. Undoubtedly, the act of rewarding and punishing belongs to Allah solely. All we know according to the Quran is that for every good deed, from the tiniest to the biggest, that is executed by human being knowingly, and even sometimes unknowingly, a good deed, there will be a recompense, a reward for it, which is likely to be increased in manifold out of the grace of Allah from 10 to 1,000 degrees more, as he wills. Again, likewise for every wrong act or error or sin committed deliberately by a person, there will be punishment accordingly for that error or sin in equivalence to the magnitude of that error, meaning one reprisal, reprisal for one fault or one punishment for one infringement. Again, reward and punishment have to do with human actions. That's to say, if for instance, this particular coronavirus has been deliberately produced by someone or by a group of people or by a nation, that particular person or group, of group or nation incur the punishment of Allah not those who have been later affected and got sick due to the contamination or the spread of this disease. If, however, this virus, after its emergence, is contaminated to others by certain people due to their irresponsible behavior and reckless attitude, those people will incur the punishment because of their infringement of the rights of their Padlock citizens, and also because of the violation of the orders and measures that are taken by the authorities. So one of the fundamental principles of Islamic jurisprudence is the principle of individual responsibility and individual accountability, meaning everyone is responsible and accountable for his or her own acts. No one bears the burden of another, as the Quran explicitly states that. Uh, for example, uh, for those who would like to read uh, chapter Surah An'am 6 and verse number 164, and said every individual says, draws the recompense of its acts, and none and no one bears the burden of another. Your goal in the end is towards Allah, and He will tell you on the truth of the things wherein you are or you were disputing. Similarly, the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, said, whoever does wrong, it is to their own gain. Whoever does evil, it is to their own loss. And again from Quran, chapter 99, Zizan, and verse number 7 and 8, whoever does an item's weight of good shall see it. Whoever does an item's weight of evil shall see it. Meaning even you make a tiniest good, you will see it. If you commit the tiniest error, you, will, you shall see it. This being the case, though, at times not only the people who have committed aggression and caused corruption deliberately are punished by Allah, but also the people who have closed their eyes blindly, to the aggression and corruption of those people who, despite their ability to prevent, despite their ability and power, they did not act on time to prevent these people from doing uh, corruption. As again, the Quran indicates, And it says, Beware of a trial, fear a trial, which will not strike on those people who have wronged among you, but also it may strike those who remain silent in, in a sense. Meaning, uh, it will affect also those of you who, do, who may not have done the wrong, but all the good and bad people, because of their inactivity, because of their 
negligence or because they did not act in time to prevent, also they will deserve the punishment. So as, and then this is, I guess, would be enough as a response to the question of my, our dear friend, Kobe. Now, let me move on to tonight's lecture. And it will be a beginning uh, somewhat philosophical, but therefore I would like really ask my dear uh, observers, listeners, and viewers, uh, bear with me in patience and remain patient. Because to make, to make my point clear to you. As I tried to elaborate in my last lecture, the current unfortunate situation that we are facing is viewed from the perspective of Islamic spirituality based on the Quran and Sunnah, you know, as a trial, as a tribulation, as a test. So what should be then the appropriate attitude or position of a believer towards this current affliction? Our reference point is, of course, the Quran and the Prophet, and also teachings of the early masters and maybe even scholars, you know, ulama, and, and of course, urafa, Gnostics and spiritual masters and also scholars. As we learn from the uh, glorious Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, we should adopt a balanced attitude in the face of such disasters and behave prudently act on time, take part in all genuine attempts and activities that have been geared towards the treatment of the disease and also amelioration of this terrible situation, restoration of the situation for better. And we are not supposed to get into panic, nor overreact to this outbreak, nor into despair, nor should we remain inactive idle or oblivious to it, nor should they stop working and striving to find a solution to it. A state of mind, a strong attitude, a strong personality, a strong character is very much needed in the face of the present dire condition. A balanced attitude is needed. Then how can we adopt such a balanced attitude to face and handle this crisis and other similar, problems, similar ones? Of course, this question uh, means how to keep our physical and moral strength while combating this terrible disease and without losing hope and without falling into despair. That's why I have deliberately entitled tonight's lecture, Preservation of Health Through Physical and Spiritual Immunity. Because nowadays we are talking too much on bodily immunity, you know, strengthen your immune system and phys physical. And uh, as far as Islamic spirituality is concerned, as a whole Islam is concerned, we need to make a balance between the two. And we have to take it together both body and spirit. As a matter of fact, we don't make such a distinction. This notion of like body and soul, mind and body, uh, going back all the way to the ancient philosophy, but it had influence on the development uh, of many philosophical theories in the West, in particular, too much emphasis on the self-sufficiency of human being and putting all the efforts to show that human being is, is very strong, very capable, and can overcome uh, and, and with the abilities, potentialities that are invested in him without the aid of any spiritual power. And, but the question again, how to combat this terrible disease? And I said, we, have, we need to take into account all dimensions of human being. Apparently, uh, how to keep your physical moral strength? Uh, the question to this, uh, you know, the answer to this question may vary from one individual to another, from one culture to another, from one region to another, depending on the 
world view of the person involved. Any attempt, nevertheless, is uh, you know at finding a response to question. Question, in my humble opinion, or at least uh, I argue for it, concerns the very understanding of human personality, which in turn involves the formation and development of human personality self. The stronger personality one has, and the more hopeful and the more optimistic one will be in handling not only the current outbreak, but all the critical situations facing him or her. So one's bodily and spiritual strength depends on the strength of one's internal development, one's personal development. Uh, let me offer you a short overview of the philosopher's doctrine of human personality because of its pertinent, pertinence to our topic today. And again, as I uh, you know, really warn you in the beginning, it might be somewhat complicated and sophisticated, this subject I'm entering in, but for the sake of showing uh, the relevance of my title, my topic today, I need to give you a background. So most of the ancient and medieval philosophers had the opinion that human being is composed of body and soul. Body being the physical and the soul being the material. This was also commonplace in the history of the classical and medieval Islamic philosophy. And most of the thinkers like Farabi, Ibn Sina, having adopted this notion of human, human, which is composed of body and soul, dwelt mostly on the exposition of the concept of happiness, meaning how to achieve happiness here and in the hereafter. They stipulate two things in a nutshell. One, well-being of the body and well-being of the soul, which means once you take care of the body, meet all the needs that the money requires, from shelter to food, and it will reach its perfection. Likewise, when you intellectually satisfy the needs of the soul, which is called rational soul, you will see the perfection of the soul. And this very perfection will lead uh, to happiness here and in the hereafter. So when you look at the writings of these philosophers, including not only Ibn Sina and Ampara, but also uh, like, for example, a prominent Jewish philosopher, uh, Maimonides, known as in, in Arabic Musa ibn Maimun, or uh, Moshe ibn Maimun, who lived in Andalus, in Spain, produced most of his works, in the lingua franca of the time, meaning Arabic, and stressed exactly the same point. And in his book called uh, The Guide for the Perplexed, uh, in Arabic, he stated that the general object of the divine law is the well-being and welfare of the soul, and also well-being and welfare of the body. And in order to achieve the well-being of, of both the body and soul, and these philosophers proclaimed that, you know, first you have to take care of the body and then the soul, but give the priority and emphasis on the perfection of the soul. So this, uh, what I call, uh, allow me to, uh, to use this expression, this two-tier or helomorphic uh, conception of human personality as developed by the philosophers on the base of Aristotle's theory of form and matter, and the Neoplatonist doctrine of the primacy or immortality of the rational soul, appears to have advocated rather what I call a secular notion of human being, a notion which, though puts substantial emphasis on the perfection of the soul, made a sharp ontological distinction between the body and the soul. So consequently, such a dichotomous conception, which regarded human being as having been composed simply of two different entities, one physical, one corporeal, I mean, meaning corporeal, the other non-physical, immaterial, has apparently 
led to the development of several influential philosophical doctrines and theories, especially in the Western world, and a prominent of which is what is known today as secular humanism. Now, secular humanism exposes that human being can be ethically and morally good without referring to religion or without faith and religion. That's, that's to say, human being, according to this doctrine of humanism, is capable of acquiring ethical and moral virtues through his or her reason alone, without referring to any religious tradition. Even, they further claim, he or she can be spiritually, you uh, know, uh, spiritual, of course, very uh, mysterious term, rationally spiritual, though, again, it's difficult to grasp the meaning of it. So the consequence of adopting such a dry, abstract notion, which takes up human being as self-sufficient, devoid of God, independent, and detached completely from his or her time-honored divine spiritual roots is obvious. And today we can see the consequences in our society. People are panicking on the, in the present circumstances because of our belief and delusive self-sufficiency, we have always given priority, priority to feeding our flesh and body, neglecting completely our souls and spirit to such an extent that we have gotten sick in consequence of excessive eating and drinking. We have become so greedy that we have forgotten the very meaning of hunger even. Even today, we have lined up in front of the grocery stores with the fear that the foods or drinks or beverages may run, out, may run out. Now look at the Quran, how beautifully states here to describe the condition of this person. Kalla, inna insana layadha, and ra'ahu stagna. This is, again, the first chapter of the Quran, meaning the first chapter which was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, and the uh, Iqra, and the uh, Verse number six and seven. Let me give the translation. It says, man, human being, transgresses once. Despite this, meaning despite the fact that we taught him, we gave him, gave him everything, we you know, invested him with all the potentialities, we taught him by the pen, we created him from nothing. And despite all these favors which we have given him, the human being still tends to rebel. Because, why? And Rahustana, because he sees himself self-sufficient. He thinks that he is independent. <laughs> Which means, man crosses the limits. Since he deems himself to be self-sufficient and free of need, and so long as man is in need of others, he feels humbled. But when he thinks that he goes, he doesn't need anyone, he tends towards transgression, develops tendency to the wrongdoing. Look how, the, how, how uh, much we are dependent on our health workers, health professionals today. That shows our weakness, but it's important. It's important. And, and the, I will uh, hopefully next week talk about the, and on the notion of trust, meaning tevekkul in connection with, you know, making all our efforts as a human being to the best of our ability to prepare ourselves for all kinds of uh, predictable or unpredictable circumstances and exhaust all your means and leave the rest to the care of Allah. Exactly likewise, we do everything within our means and empower our, our health scientists and make them, give them all the available means to come up with a solution. And of course, this is human side of it, but in the end, expect the result from God Almighty. Now, uh, because human being sees himself self-sufficient, he become intoxicated with power and start dominating and enslaving others. So human being self-centeredness and too much dependency 
on his individualism or her individualism, on his or her exclusive attachment to merely mundane pleasures, worldly pleasures, have eventually led him to succumb to greed, passion, temper, envy, so much so that he has virtually become obedient to all these material desires. So human ambition and greed, why? Because of dissatisfaction, because of, of his concern for his body only. And human ambition and greed have unfortunately become an important criterion of character today and status in the modern world. Criterion was supposed to be good deeds and morals instead of power and wealth. So honor and dignity come with good works and good manners and morals, not true material influence. Since human being relies very much on the power of his reason, he thinks that all the physical means, resources, activities, measures, including scientific tools are required by reason for preserving bodily health. Then what would happen to the other side of human being? Would the bodily health be sufficient for human being? What would happen to the internal dimension of human? If you, don't want, you do not want to use the spiritual. And actually my question was, what would be to the spiritual side of human? So this question brings us to Islamic spirituality's understanding of human personality. And so spiritual masters and spiritually trained scholars of Islam have held rather a holistic view of human being, whose major features they extracted mainly from the Quran, Quranic verses, and relevant Quranic verses, and also relevant prophetic hadith. And later they further developed and crystallized through their own insights. As far as human being is concerned, there are mainly two words in the Quran. I would like to pay attention to this. One is insan, a generic term, inclusive of both genders, men and women, meaning literally human being, which we elaborated in our last lecture, actually the root meaning of the term last lecture, which meaning forgetfulness and remembrance, remembrance. The other is Adam, a rather technical term, a prototype or denoting mainly of a fully cultivated, developed human being as it is also used to, to refer to the first human being, Adam, the prophet, first prophet, Adam. The very individual identity or ipsaity of human being is indicated in the Quran by the term nafs. Therefore, in one verse of the Quran, it says, we will show you our signs are far in the horizon in the universe, as well as emphasis within yourselves, self. So the current term self meaning one and indivisible. One and indivisible, which is inclusive all, of all human faculties and dimensions, body and soul, body and spirit, limbs and senses, internally and externally, all together. So this very term next, self as such, ontologically speaking, permits no division at all. No division. Therefore, all the divisions like body and soul, espoused by the philosophers can only be accepted in Islam, in general and Islamic spiritual in particular, epistemologically, for the sake of, you know, maybe teaching pedagogically, not ontologically. Hence, it's almost impossible for a genuinely Quranic-minded Muslim to adopt a secular human personality, let alone secular humanism or even just humanism. So the Quran crowns human being with a divine breath or spirit called, you know, ruh, which is inhaled in the womb of the mother by the divine. Look at this verse from the Quran again. And the Hijr, chapter 15, uh, 29. فَإِذَا فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ When I have shaped him, God Almighty is telling us, meaning human being, when I shaped him or when I put him in due proportion and breathed into him of my spirit, then 
you fall down as respect to him, prostrate to him. So we are carrying with us something divine, bro, that makes human a human. Therefore, I could say in Islamic spirituality, human being is a spiritual being par excellence in the first place. And look, I would like to also quote another verse from the Quran. Allow me to take a sip of my tea. From Surah to Maryam, chapter Maryam, and this speaks about the pain of Maryam just before her giving birth to Isa, السلام, Jesus, peace be upon him. فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ هِجَابًا فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَبِيًّا Of course, Ruh has been used here uh, for angel who came to help or gave assurance to Maryam. The verse says, Maryam, or she took a veil to screen herself bashfulness, shyfulness, from them, from public. Then we sent to her, God's Almighty saying to her, our spirit, meaning angel, of course, here, there appeared to her a well-formed, well-made human. So in this Surah Maryam, who has been used to represent the angel who was sent by Allah to Maryam when she was having pangs and pains prior to giving birth to Jesus. Now, allow me to share with you at this juncture a beautiful anecdote from our spiritual master, Maldana Jalal al And uh, I will uh, maybe uh, read a long quotation for the sake of understanding the importance of the spirit, spirit and spirituality and how he really comments on this particular words and, and maybe uh, the the uh, message that I extracted from the elaboration of Mevlana, Mevlana's elaboration on these words, he says, every one of us has a potential to give birth to a Jesus within ourselves, provided that we endure the pains of the trials with perseverance and patience and remain intimately connected with our Lord. That's what it means. But let me quote to you a little long quotation. And it, this is in Fihima Fi, Discourses of Rumi. It is pain that guides us in every enterprise until there is an ache within, a passion, a yearning for that thing arising within us we will never strive to attain it. Without pain, he continues, it remains beyond our reach, whether it is success in this world or salvation in the next, whether we aim at becoming a merchant or a king or a scientist or an astronomer. It was not until the pains of birth manifested in Mary, Mariam, that she made for, it, for the tree, those pangs drove her to the tree, the tree was withered and became fruitful. We are, Rumi emphasizes here, I'm quoting again, we are like the story of Mary in the Quran. Every one of us has a Jesus within us. But until the pangs, pains manifest, our Jesus is not born. If the pangs never come, then our child rejoins its origin by the same secret path through which it came, leaving us empty without the birth of our true self. So this is also kind of self-realization, self-reflection, and understanding the significance of our spirituality. And he says, again, there is a poetry quoted by Mevlana himself here, your inward soul, your spirit is hungry, yet your outward flesh is overfed. The devil has gorgeous sickness. The king begs even for bread, even for bread. The cure is found while Jesus is there within you. Okay. 
it is the end of God. So human being is enlivened by a spirit from the divine. So that spirit should be fostered and should be well maintained, should be strengthened. If we, and this is exactly the position of Islamic spirituality and spiritual masters. And they, and most of the uh, Gnostics of Islam, we call Urafa Arifun, and scholars, like spiritual minded scholars, take insan, human being, as ruh, meaning spirit. And uh, like, uh, and also, also uh, body, but not, it's in their inseparable, one entity, and together. And uh, spirit for them is considered as the locus or place of love. And that is metaphysical. So reason cannot enter that domain. So reason has to do with your intellectual dimensions, with the maintenance of your bodily needs. But your spiritual dimension, they needs to be well fed, well maintained, well preserved. And so we do not make a distinction, a secular distinction, body and soul here, or this world or the hereafter. And I would like to bring to your attention the famous saying or maxim attributed to in, uh, in Islamic spirituality to the fourth caliph and the son-in-law of the beloved Prophet Muhammad and Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him. And he says, work in this world as if you will live forever. But at the same time, be prepared and work well as if you will work well for the hereafter, as if you will die tomorrow. So this is a balanced attitude. Now the heart is the center, where is the love of Allah. And now uh, uh, the heart is the center of knowledge, the highest of which, of course, is the knowledge of God, Ma'rifatullah. So many cultures and traditions, when you look at history, consider the heart in two forms. One, physical, a physiological organ, pumping to the entire body, blood, which also we consider, through veins, but the other immaterial, metaphorical or symbolical as the center of all activities and emotions. So Muslim spiritualists and spirituality, of course, prefer the second one. And of course, they accept also the importance of the physical, like flesh or, or organ of the heart. And uh, now the majority of Muslim scholars and the spiritual masters in the classical and medieval period of his, uh, you know, period maintain that the heart is the seat of human conscience, vijdan, and all emotion and spiritual activities. So under the present circumstances, we need to be conscious, conscientious. And so we need to reflect our within to, to, in order to make a balance between inside and outside first. And uh, for the sake of time, I, I may maybe share a couple of important points with regard to uh, uh, significance of strengthening the internal dimension of human being, the spirituality. Uh, the heart, of course, as we indicated earlier, deserves to be the locus of love. And human reason or intelligence is important too. But one entails the other. So when you reach through reasoning to a level, a pinnacle point where you stop, and that's called beyond the limit. Sometimes they say, or Abadan in, in the classical 
uh, text of Islamic spirituality, meaning nothing. So you leave there to the hands of the spirit, love, that will take you. So th this is a kind of a continuation. It's not a separation, spirit and reason. In, uh, on the contrary, it's a complement and, and reinforcing reason and helping reason, eliminating reason, making reason understand it is limitation at the same time. If we strengthen our spirituality. So when we look at the Quran, and is, is, I, I would like to illustrate my point here. Uh, for example, the, uh, the notion of heart, the term of heart occurs in many verses of the Quran, in various senses and contexts. But because of the time limitation, I will leave the subject matter maybe of the heart to another time of day. But because of this really relevance today, uh, maybe I will quote two verses and one hadith concerning the, uh, the heart. One, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبُ تَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبُ This is Rat chapter 13, 28. Those who believe, whose hearts find satisfaction, tranquility, peace, comfort in the remembrance of Allah. So, without doubt, in the remembrance of Allah, hearts find satisfaction. So, immunity of, uh, in a sense, spiritual immunity has to do with the remembrance of Allah under all the circumstances. And that will uh, render us, that will keep us peaceful, tranquil, and comfortable. And at the same time, of course, dynamic, not idle. And of course, if we put too much emphasis on our individuality, neglecting this uh, side of the heart, and take only reason alone as a powerful instrument, and look at what the Quran says. So yeah, Surah Al-Araq, uh, chapter 7, verse number 179. And That's a beautiful description. It says, they have hearts with which they don't understand. They don't understand, meaning because too much dependency on reason, leaving aside the conscience, spirituality. They have eyes with which they don't see because internal eye. They have ears with which they don't hear, meaning internal ear. They are like livestock, bestial animals, bestial beasts in a sense. And of course, this is not a diminution of animals at all, but uh, in terms, of course, uh, like. Uh, uh, position and rather they are more astray. It is they who are the heedless, to, so they don't seem to take heed of this. So the Prophet Muhammad Islam says, therefore, there is a flesh or a subtle organ in human body. If it is clean and pure, the rest of the body will be clean and pure. If it is sordid, impure, the rest becomes filthy. That is the heart itself. End of the hadith. So if your spirituality is intact, or let me take negatively, if your spiritual immunity is not intact, is not well sustained, moral diseases may afflict the heart, in addition to the physical diseases, and cause serious harm to the execution of its regular functions. Even these diseases of the heart may render you, in the end, completely dysfunctional, like leaving its possessor, leaving the person in a state of psychological discomfort, distress, if not pushing him or her to evils, or turning him into completely an aggressive, if not a monster, devoid of understanding and moral, moral conscience. Therefore, the Quran warns us of the consequence of those two problematic, troublesome hearts. He says, Muhammad 
for the second time, just reading translation, chapter 5, 52, you have seen those whose hearts are sick. Maraz. Fataralladene fiqulu maradun. Yani, whose hearts are sick, ill, running around among the people saying, oh, we are afraid of being struck by disaster. We are afraid of being struck by disaster. So this is first illustration example for this heart. And this, I like heart, which is closed, blind. But the heart which has become dysfunctional, this is an example from the, again, uh, Quran. Your hearts became hardened after that, after this situation, meaning chapter 2, 74. Then your hearts became so hardened after that, being like stones, even harder than the stones. And therefore, most of the spiritual masters in medieval time, early time, concentrated on the exposition of the meaning of heart and its importance for human being. Like one, two, maybe one example, there is a famous Gnostic, Abu Talib al Mekki, who died in 996. Look at this, 996, and, and titled his work, Ut al Qulub. The nourishment of the heart or hearts. Nourishment. And again, 1111 uh, Abu Hamid al Ghazali in, in, in many places of his books, in particular, is in his Ihya al Ubuddin, Verification of the Religious Sciences, devoted considerable space on the significance of heart. Why? The food of the heart, knowledge, reflection, and remembrance of Allah. Vis a vis the food of the mind which is only knowledge. That, that's very important. The food of the heart, knowledge, reflection, meaning tafakkur and the contemplation, and remember, il fikr zikr in Arabic. So the life of the heart is knowledge, then that's why Ali bin Abi Talib al-Risim again, he says, the life of the heart is knowledge. Hayatul qalb is ilm, yani ilm al the life of the heart is knowledge, then take heed and avail yourself of knowledge. Whereas the death of the heart, mental cult, the death of the heart, is ignorance, then shun ignorance. And again, uh, even Atayillah, may Allah be pleased with him, of course, a uh, very famous uh, spiritual master of Islamic civilization, he says, reflection, thought, is the light of the heart, chest. The source of happiness, the fakir. The reflection, contemplation goes away from the heart. When it goes away, it remains without light, turns dark, and falling into ignorance and self conceit and deception, and seeing himself basically independent and self sufficient. Therefore, the physical and spiritual immunity or preservation of human beings' health in, in totality is succinctly stated in this beautiful verse of the Quran, which will be the conclusion of my lecture today. And, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَلَا نُحْيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا وَلَا نَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسِنٍ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ This, again, from chapter 16, Nahl, verse number 97. Whoever does good, whether male or female, yet having faith in Allah, important. So rationally spiritual doesn't help here. Spiritually spiritual is important. Rational at the same time, spiritual, but having faith in Allah. Whoever does good and whether male or female, and, yet, and at the same time he is a believer, we will most certainly Give him a life, a happy life, a happy life, a life uh, you know, as a total. And he will most certainly give them also the reward for the best of by the, by what they did here. So they will attain a good life, and life is good here, a pure life. Also, they will get the reward for their actions in the end. Being fully aware of the essentiality of keeping body and spirit healthy together, therefore, Muslim spiritual masters, in addition to their extensive teachings on, the, on strengthening the spirituality, 
devoted considerable portion of their writings to the importance and relevance of the inner dimensions of the religion of Islam, from prayer, fasting, legal alms, and pilgrimage, to the preservation of the health of the body. And he says, look, even the pillars of Islam, from, from the prayer to pilgrimage, including fasting, you know, have two dimensions, physical and spiritual. Both are there to strengthen your physical and spiritual immunity. And uh, maybe for the uh, time, for the, for the time being, I will stop here. Assalamu alaikum hocam, thank you very much for your uh, lecture and we really loved it. And my question is about like, okay, you talked about a continuum between heart and mind and the Islamic tradition, but you know, we also have another fact, which is like, you know, the uh, underdevelopment of modern science in the Muslim world. So do you think it's our philosophy, our epistemological approach to body and mind, mind and heart and this continuum that like led us not to follow up like with the West and, you know, because, you know, with this modern rationality, uh, you know, they developed sciences and we couldn't. And then also that had consequences. So, Excellent. Thank you. A, a, a excellent question. No, on the contrary, uh, uh, according to Muslim spiritual masters, you have to depend on reason. And reason is important. It's a gift from God Almighty. But there are two types of reason. One is daily, for purposes, daily use, they call it aklimaat, like a lizat or, you know, and one, the other one is universal reason, which is, of course, divine. So reason is definitely needed, and that's the gift of Allah Almighty. But uh, by itself, depending wholly and solely on the power of reason has been disputed. So not at all. And even Mevlana Rumi and uh, himself and, uh, speaks about how important reason, uh, uh, you know, for understanding our daily issues. But reason is incapable of going beyond the, this world. So for those who accept the next world, the unseen, I mean, of course, a metaphysical world, like all the believers, then reason, as we learn also from Kant, you know, will not be able to rightly penetrate into the domain of the metaphysics. Therefore, the uh, healthiest way from the perspective of Islam in general, in Islamic study in particular, is go through senses, reason, okay, to the utmost level, then carry on your journey through, of course, uh, what we call uh, spirituality. So spirit, spirituality, in fact, uh, keeps the balance of reason. Now, uh, allow me to, again, give you as an example from uh, Mevlana. He says, Human being has two wings. One wing is terrestrial or earthly, bodily, okay? The other wing spiritual and divinely. So, and you need to make a balance between the two in order to conduct your affairs in this world. Very, very important. Now, not too much uh, like sensual, not too much, you know, purely spiritual. So there is no, like, a, uh, uh, there is no way to exclude one or to include one at the exclusion of another. So he says, if you leave human being completely dependent on his senses or reason, you know, because they are earthly, he will be pulled down and he will be completely disworldly. That's fine. But that would not be enough to make human to be human. Because what 
makes human being complete and perfect is exactly as we find in the Quran in the notion of the Khalifa by Sajjarat. That requires us to take into account both spiritual dimension and physical dimension and make a balance between the two. From this point, therefore, I may uh, further add that uh, any type of secular division, not only on the understanding of a human being, but also on, on, in, in, in any other subject that is related to you know, uh, spiritual matters, is unacceptable. And uh, uh, like, uh, can you sacrifice your otherworldly expectation for the sake of this world in Islam? No. Therefore, that beautiful maxim and eloquently stated by Ali ibn Abi Talib may Allah please with him, you know, work for this world as if you will never die, but at the same time, prepare yourself for the next world as if you will die tomorrow. It's a balance, balance. So in fact, uh, uh, this sound state mind will keep us humble, modest, but at the same time strong. Will help us to, you know, be caring and sharing. And uh, human virtues that we would like to really adopt. We would like to practice. But it, and and the, uh, it will keep us, as I said, uh, in constant check and balance. Um, and we, uh, it will help us to remember always that we are fakir, <laughs> this technical term. I'm using in the spiritual sense, not the physical fakir, meaning we are completely in need of our creator. And, uh, you know, we are not mustaghni, as, as the Quran says. We are dependent, not independent. I would like to, again, uh, pray to God Almighty to keep all of us well and healthy, spiritually and physically. And inshallah, we'll again get together face to face in our next lecture uh, next week. Until then, I leave you in the good care of Allah Almighty. Assalamu alaikum. May God's peace and blessings be upon all of you. Thank you.